Standing in the proper spot. Oh, yeah, we can't see your face. There it is. So, <laughs> welcome everybody. Uh, as you know, here at ABG, we have an amazing uh, bunch of, of uh, native <laughs> carnivorous plants, including a nationally accredited collection of Saracenia. And, um, and uh, Carson, Will, and Max, and I all work with them in some capacity or another. Um, we were talking and I realized that they hadn't ever actually seen them in the wild. And I grew up in the area, so I figured that we'd all get together, we'd go on a trip, we'd take about four or five days and go on a grand trip through the Panhandle and up into Alabama and take a look at some of these um, fascinating and uh, really unusual habitats. Thank you. And that's our presentation. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to have to work these newfangled contraptions. So, what? Can you press just the forward button? Press the forward yeah, yeah. Or the backward? Yeah, yeah. Please stand by. We don't. Yeah. We don't. Please stand by. We're going to take the technical. Can you do it manually? It was shift yeah, working. Yeah. And now it works from our spawn. Computer is about to crash. There, now try it. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So here is a brief overview of how the talk will go. So first we're going to go over the mission, why we went down there, uh, to recap it again. Then we'll go over the route, um, the sites that we went to, and the key plant species that we saw at each site. And then we'll go over our conclusion, some key takeaways, and how we hope to apply these practices. And then we'll open up the floor for questions and discussion. So, thanks for the great introduction. Our uh, mission and objective, is there a possible way to get rid of some of these extra things here? Let's see. Put the X. There we yeah. go. Nicely done. Mission and objective. So these are pretty important planning any trip, executing any trip. This is what centers us all. So uh, because each of us worked directly with our Saracenia collection in some capacity, the unifying goal for the trip was to observe the various species of pitcher plants in situ. Everybody familiar with the term in situ? If you aren't, we're just saying in their native habitat where they exist naturally. And to observe various types of wet wetland habitats in which they occur. So several different types of wetlands we're gonna look at here, um, not just our standard bog, from this information, we hope to apply what we learned to our own cultivation practices to improve the overall quality of our conservation and display collections. We need seeing these plants in their native habitats would allow us to bring a much needed context to our collections in the gardens and strengthen our ability to engage ABG visitors, all our guests throughout our work. This unique opportunity allowed us as members of both the conservation department and the horticulture department to plan a trip together, to work together, and uh, really find our intersection of the collection here. Saracenias bring us all together, our picture plants. Sorry for all you people that don't ever work with Saracenias. Um, so uh, like Trey was saying, we took this sort of grand trip through the Florida Panhandle, um, looking at various different habitats and uh, sites of special carnivorous plant interests. Um, and I'll just, we started in Atlanta, which is like, um, and drove down to our first site to uh, stay at Trey's mother's house. Um, definition of like a Southern Belle. She was just the nicest lady. She had chicken pot pie ready for us when we got to her house. Um, it was a great jumping off point um, for our first day in Apalachicola National Forest, where we went to several sites within the forest. Uh, following that, we took a trip over westward towards Deer Lake State Park, where we've been doing conservation work um, with the, the garden for the past 20 years. Carson will talk about that. Um, after we left Deer Lake, we went to the Eglin, Eglin, Eglin Air Force Base, uh, which contiguous with the Blackwater River State Forest forms one of the largest, I think the largest uh, remnant longleaf pine ecosystem in the world. Um, 
Those are two different sites though. And then for our final day, we did a, a mega huge epic call from Northwestern Florida, the Blackwater River up to Splinter Hill Bog, just over the state line in Alabama. And then all the way up to Montgomery to see the, uh, one of the few sites of Saracenia albumensis. And we also did another Nature Conservancy site trip that day, but it's not uh, germane to this type of conversation. So we'll talk about it another time. All right. Good thing working here. I don't know. Yes. Oh, no. Now back. Back. Yeah, all right. Okay, so this was our first day. Uh, this is the Apalachicola National Forest. Uh, all of this is essentially my backyard. So um, it's a fascinating region. There are, uh, it's a biodiversity hotspot. It might be one of the, one of the most interesting on the entire continent, really. Um, up here at the top, and there's a lot of things nearby that we may be familiar with just working here with our collection at ABG. Um, the little red square at the top there, that's Terea State Park and the Apalachicola uh, Bluffs and Ravines Preserve, where Terea, Taxopolia, and Taxus, Florida, are found. Uh, the star is what's called the Kurtz Bog, also known as the uh, Hosford Bog, which is, a, I'll get to that in a second. Down here, this is the Sumatra Bog, um, which is, a, it's huge. It's got to be, uh, actually, there's a sort of a mosaic of, of longleaf pines, slash pine, flatwoods, and uh, pitcher plant bogs in this area. This is Tate's Hill, which we stopped at very briefly. And let's see. So our first stop, was what is I was always taught it was called the Kurtz bog. The Kurtz was a uh, was a botanist who was uh, prominent, and I guess it was in the 1800s. He described many of the species in the area. Most people just call it the Hosford bog after the small town nearby. And what's interesting about this place is that um, fire was excluded from many of the habitats across the region, and so where you would have had flatwoods. Um, you know, sort of mixed in with uh, a lot of interesting bog habitats. The the bogs grew up into tie tie stands or tie tie thickets, which is Cliftonia and Cyrilla, like very very dense thickets that you can barely walk through. Where they as they were once very open, but they're highly fire dependent. And so um, when fire was removed from the system here, uh, as you can see in the background, that's all what we would call at home a tie tie thicket. And um, right here in the uh, right of way, this area was able to keep its plant assemblage because of the mowing um, along the right of way, which sort of mimicked the effect of fire. It just removed a lot of the woody species out of the way and allowed the carnivorous plants to, uh, to persist or to thrive rather. Um, it's unusual that we find Venus flytraps here uh, because of course they're only native to the Carolinas, but Somehow, uh, and I'm not sure what the real story is, but someone transplanted them there. What did I just do? <laughs> you pressed the wrong button. Of course I did. Yeah. All right. Cool. So pressing the correct button takes us to this slide. Mm -hmm. so we can see the uh, Saracenia look at the level. The Ghanaian uh, Lusticula, the Crossera Intermedia, and uh, the Crossera Tracii here. It's um, sort of a very small seepage slope surrounded by uh, pine plantations, really, although they seem to have converted to longleaf pine instead of slash pine, which is kind of, kind of nice. But um, still, it's really spectacular to be able to see these in, in the wild. And I was told before we went that there are much better locations to see Venus flytraps in Florida. And because this one is so easily accessible from the highway that they've just been, people have stopped and pulled them out of the ground, but they were very plentiful there and, and it didn't look like it had been, um, they had been overly uh, harvested, I suppose. So after we left this little site, we drove down into the national forest and just outside of what we call the Sumatra bog, there's this, this is not, totally germane, but it's such a nice spot because we're just talking about it. It's this little uh, ephemeral wetland, maybe less than an acre in extent. And I say ephemeral, so I suppose it does dry up occasionally, but generally it's about knee deep. And um, it's, you can see these are mostly Nisabiflora and they're covered with Tillandsia. And um, 
and we've even got some of these uh, little epiphytic orchids growing on the green fly orchid there. And it's, you know, you just sit there and you can listen to the, uh, uh, what, are, what are they? Prothonotory warblers. The prothonotory warblers, yes. And it's just an absolutely lovely spot. And the Sumatra bog. Now this one is, it's hundreds and hundreds of acres in extent. And I, I suppose it would have been useful to have a sort of a satellite picture of it, but I've got some drone footage we'll look at in just a second. But it's, um, it's extremely diverse. You'll see all like five different families of carnivorous plants here. It's the gradient between the seepage slope and the wetland in the center is very, very low. So um, very, very slight changes in elevation can lead to a completely different plant community. And um, strangely enough, like almost in the uplands, you, you'd see the, uh, the Pinguicula lutea, and um, you'll see the, the tinium, and the, down here in the center of the bog, you'll get planifolia and uh, Drosera intermedia, and uh, uh, several different kinds of uh, pagonias. And then once you get toward the center, you'll see uh, a lot more Saracenia blava, and some various Coreopsis and so forth. So um, it's sort of a, this represents some sort of a Goldilocks zone for the carnivorous plants. It's just, it's, you know, the over here, it's a little bit too high and dry, over here it's too wet, right here in, in the center of the bog is just right. So another thing that I should have mentioned when we looked at the uh, the Tupelo Dome is that the, the, it's so nutrient deprived. There's very little organic material or very little, um, you know, very low nutrients in the soil here. So the trees get sort of, they're almost like natural bonsai. So some of these cypress out here can be maybe 10 or 12 feet high and hundreds of years old. So it's um, not far away from here is, is Tate's Hell, which has some of the, what they call hat rack cypress, I, th I suppose. That's another, another thing that's worth its own trip and presentation. So this is a little diagram that shows the hydrology of the system like this. In fact, I believe this diagram was actually drawn to represent a site in the Blackwater uh, State Forest. So what you'll have is an, a, a pine savanna here, and then the, the herb bog here and the wetland in the center. So you'll have a very permeable layer with an aqua fluid underlying that, which is mostly clay or thick sandy clay or clay sand. So rainwater will percolate down through the sand and then run along that aqua fluid until they intersect here at the edge of the bog and you'll get a sheet flow across into the wetland. And with the proper fire management or a proper fire uh, regime, it'll be enough to clear the woodies off of the herb bog. So here's the drone footage. Do we need to just... So you can kind of get a sense of the vast extent of this bog here. And you can also see how vehicles probably logging vehicles or maybe recreational vehicles have traversed the herb bog portion over time, and that can radically alter the hydrology of the system. I wish we had better resolution because it's pretty spectacular. And we hit it right before everything fully emerged. So it was, um, you know, if we, had, if we had waited another month or so, it would have been a completely different thing to look at. Here we are again. I'm okay with it. <laughs> it was great though. The weather was perfect this day. We, we hiked all the way through the forest and out here and then back again. What time of year did you go? This was in April. Trey, what kind of depth are each of the layers? Like a sand layer, for example, how much sand layer do you have on top of that sort of sheet of water? It, well, it depends on where you are. Um, and this place is going to be fairly thin, yep. um, just a few meters. But in the Blackwater or some of these other places that have a, a lot steeper gradient, it could it could be uh, very much thicker than that. The further away from the bog you get, like at Deer Lake, there's some some pretty steep. They're very small in extent, but still there, there's a lot more relief. So it really just depends on uh, the individual situation. We already saw. Did we already see this one? No. Yeah. Anyway, so this is a close up look at some of the the plants that we found in the. 
Sumatra bottom. It was really interesting to see the difference in, in elevation between the locations of the two different pinguicula species that we saw. But you'll see uh, so many different uh, Saracenias here. You'll see all, all the Saracenias basically, except for Albopensis, I guess. But um, at this site. At this site, yeah. Right. One of my favorite places in the world. I highly, highly recommend anybody going to take a look at it. It's very easy to get to. And um, they've, it's been very well maintained. Like, I, I would say that they must burn it every year or two um, in order to maintain the conditions here. All right. Deer Lake. So, Deer Lake State Park. Um, the, sorry, the main aim of the project at Deer Lake State Park is to restore the vanishing wetlands and pitcher plant bogs by opening them up, reestablishing natural plant and animal communities, as well as um, improving the water quality there. So ABG has been working at Deer Lake since 2012, and Deer Lake has wetlands supporting three coastal dune lakes. Um, and the dune lakes here act as a filter for the water, which eventually ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. And so we were shown around this site by members of the conservation department, Jeff Talber, Ashlyn Smith, and Caitlin Crocker. So shout out to them. Thanks for showing us around. Um, so part of the work at Deer Lake is to monitor how the different restoration approaches will work better or worse. And so this is a picture of one of the experimental plots that's being prepared for restoration monitoring um, at the site. So in order to prepare this plot, um, first uh, it was cleared of vegetation and then an excavator was brought in and mechanically scraped the, the site. And then data spore material, which is just jargon for, for seeds, was collected from four reference prairies throughout Point Washington State Forest and it was applied here. And so um, this experimental plot and a few others will just be used to monitor how these different seeds will establish over time. Um, and so they'll be monitored over the next three years. And another thing I wanna point out in this photo is the Clictonia that is right in front of Will. Um, and I wanted to point it out because it's so large and this is due to fire suppression. Uh, we actually have a Clictonia here um, in Midtown in Max's display bog that you guys can look at after the presentation that shows what its form and size would ideally be like um, in this habitat. So um, in the Florida Panhandle, decades of fire suppression and um, some cases over 80 years of fire suppression have severely degraded these habitats. And so um, when you eliminate fire from the habitats, shrubs like Clictonia that are supposed to be small will grow to the size of small trees, like I showed in the previous slide. Um, and that shades out the open prairies and bogs and changes the balance of the ecosystem, which in turn um, degrades the water quality, um, which will eventually end up in the Gulf of Mexico. And so using the GPS data um, and aerial photography from as far back as 1941, the gardens conservation team have identified areas of highest priority to work on at Deer Lake. Um, and so once the areas are identified, the crews have gone in and cleared out the Clictonia, the Tai Tai, and then after they've cleared out and chipped and removed all the overgrown tai tai, fire has been slowly reintroduced um, to maintain the re-sprouting. And so after years of repeated burns, the organic layer that has built up over time will be reduced and the nutrient poor soil, sandy soils that are needed um, for these wetland communities to thrive will eventually come back. And so the conservation horticulture team works really closely with the Florida team as the seeds that are collected here are um, brought to us and we grow them here and then they'll be reintroduced back in areas where um, they have been depleted or vanished completely. And so here are some of the 
plants that we saw at Deer Lake. Um, I want to point out uh, the Pinguicula lutea, which is the middle, the top middle um, photo. And this one is notable because it was collected by Jeff Talbert, a member of the ABG staff, and then it was propagated at Midtown and then reintroduced back at Deer Lake. So it's kind of a really cool full circle success story. Um, that's really exciting. And then I also wanted to talk about one of the sites that I have listed here that we visited, the power line cut. And this site is interesting because um, similar to Kurtzbog, which Trey mentioned earlier, um, because it's below um, a utility line, it has been maintained. Um, and so basically everything has been cut back there and that has mimicked the fire. And so it was cool to see what plant species that we saw at the power line cut versus other sites. And um, one of the coolest ones that we saw was Pinguicula pumula. That is the tiny purple flower. And this was the only place where we saw this species. So that was also really cool. And then um, while we were at Deer Lake, we started to peer inside of more of the pitcher plants. And um, when we did that, we saw the Zyra moth, which is the, the top left corner. Um, and so basically the pitcher plant is a host for the Zyra moth. And so while, you know, normally we think of pitcher plants as consuming insects, they can also be a really important food source. And the Zyra moth has actually been adapted, um, both the caterpillar and the adult moth have been adapted to um, exist and uh, climb inside of the slippery sides of the pitcher plant. And so um, while restoring these wetlands, we're also restoring the insects and other communities on the sites, which is really cool. So, yeah. All right, here we are after the full day at Deer Lake, full sun exposure. It was really nice to go to our next site at Eglin Air Force Base. Um, here we are, this is actually, uh, this photo is standing in the creek. So we're up to waste uh, the chest height water, nice cool water there. Um, within this space, the Air Force Base itself, it's about half a million acres. Um, and as Will mentioned, it lies uh, the largest contiguous stand of old growth longleaf pine in the world. This location itself is home to 106 rare listed plant and animal species. So it has a wide biodiversity there, a lot of conservation value, um, which is interesting. This Air Force Base um, has uh, operations running on it at uh, all times. But uh, through that and through prescribed burns, that management helps keep these rare species alive. So you don't always think that it's going to coexist, but it clearly does here. Um, part of being an Air Force base is uh, public access is definitely limited. Um, different management units throughout the entire base, um, they would open and close every morning. So uh, we had to keep checking the uh, closures map to make sure that the sites we wanted to go to were going to be open on that exact day. Um, prior to going here, uh, it was closed for three days. So we were getting a little uh, worried that it wouldn't be open, but we lucked out and it was perfect. Um, as part of the permit process as well, uh, I wanted to note that we had to watch several safety videos, one of them being what to do in case you found unexploded ordnance. <laughs> um, so there are several different videos showing us what they look like, who to flag down, what to do. Uh, I was kind of looking forward to seeing something like that, but we didn't find anything. Um, <laughs> luckily during your visit, yes, it was open. And uh, this is a spring fed creek that goes throughout the uh, Air Force Base. Um, the main, main CP here to see carnivorous plant was our Saracenia leucophila. So on the edges of the creek, this track that we waded into, um, there's this floating vegetative mat. And you can see all the white top picture plants that are here in the background. And then with those, it was awesome to see, um, let's take a closer look, our Arantium aquaticum, so our golden club, which some of you may recognize um, looks kind of arum-like, especially if you see its inflorescence, these spadex flowers, um, also known as a water arum. So it's in that Araceae um, family that I know we deal with on a daily basis here. Um, Awesome to see this in its native habitat, just kind of persisting on the edges of these floating mats. 
Um, they were not only in flower, but they were also in fruit. So given in April, this kind of this site really showed me how ahead the panhandle is from us in terms of a couple months for bloom time. Um, along with those, you'll see these white flowers here. We had our American water lily floating right around the edge as well. So three great species to see together all uh, in bloom at the same time. Here's us enjoying the creek. And not only did we go to Live Oak Creek, but we also traveled to Boiling uh, Creek, which was a little bit further west. At that time, you can see in the background here, the storms are really starting to come in. Thunder was in the background. Uh, we started to go in, the water was pretty high, I would say uh, head and higher. So uh, we decided not to do that for the day, um, but instead carry on. If ever you want to travel anywhere in the Panhandle, obviously all these locations are great to visit, but this was truly one of the most unique experiences. I think floating in, wading into a creek, botanizing there on the side, it really brought it all home for me. Next up. Yeah, that was <clears throat> that was a crazy experience for sure. Um, so after we left Eglin Air Force, we traveled just like 10 or 20 miles up the road to Blackwater River State Forest um, for the third time. It's contiguous with Eglin and one other state park to form the largest stand of longleaf left in the world at about a million acres. Um, for context, there used to be 100 million acres of longleaf. Um, and so the biggest stand left is less than 1% of what it used to cover. So, you know, it's kind of sad, but it's great that there are places like this that we can still go see, you know, an example of what they used to be. Um, so Blackwater River is a large and diverse forest um, that's sort of held together by the Blackwater River that runs through. Um, Blackwater in Choctaw is Okaloosa, and this is found in Okaloosa County. Um, so it's always nice to see like a a little tie-in with the native peoples. Um, and it was interesting um, when we first got to Blackwater, you know, we were all excited. It was our last stop of the day. We were pumped up from that Luca Phyllis swim we had just had. And of all the sites that we went to, this was really the only one that had extreme um, evidence of like bad humanness. Um, you know, like any any state forest or recreational area is susceptible to human activities. Um, you know, even if we're being very careful, we're always disturbing or impacting any natural areas that we go to just by being there. Um, but if if you're doing this type of impact, uh, you should probably reconsider the places that you recreate in. Especially, um, it was especially concerning to see this amount of waste just a couple of meters away from the river itself. Um, so I know no one in here does that, but if you have any friends that do that, you should probably reconsider your friendship with them. Um, okay. So in a really similar um, scenario that we saw at Apalachicola, uh, we found this um, seepage slope that uh, had sort of these three zones, the upland longly, not really upland, but more upland longleaf, this sweet spot in the middle where the carnivorous plant proliferated in the presence of fire, I'll add, and then this lower area where the water pooled and allowed, it basically excluded fire from having so much water in it and it allowed woody vegetation to dominate. Um, so between these ecotones, which is just the area between the, the different habitats, um, this is where the water that is bound by that confining clay layer underneath seeps out over the sand um, and that superficial aquifer seeps over the carnivorous plant bog and then pools into the, the, the stream at the end. So you can really tell like the carnivorous plants like it between the pines and the shrubs and sometimes a little bit into the shrubs but not really anywhere else. Um, and like Trey said this uh, figure from the textbook of Florida landscapes is actually inspired directly from this site that we were at at Blackwater River. So that was always that was kind of a, a neat little thing that we got to see there. Um, so a couple of plants that we saw at uh, Blackwater, we didn't really see, you know, by this point we had, I mean, basically by Sumatra, we had seen every carnivorous plant that we were going to encounter. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't see any new carnivorous plants here, but we did see a couple of plants that were more indicative of the Piedmont and further north, um, including the Atlantic white cedar on the bottom left, which lines the Blackwater River 
um, throughout the, the state forest. Um, it was pretty interesting to see Tillandsia growing on that, the Spanish moss. Because usually, you know, the species occurring much further north does not, you know, basically north of Virginia doesn't have the opportunity to have Spanish moss on it. So that was pretty interesting for me to see. Um, and we also saw the state listed, believe it or not, Calmia latifolia, which is super common in the Piedmont in Georgia and like prolific further north, but barely dipping down into Florida. So it was pretty interesting to see it there. Um, we also saw uh, our only poison sumac of the trip. Um, and, you know, none, we don't really see poison sumac so often, especially in comparison to poison ivy. So we we're all kind of like huddled around it trying to figure what it was and luckily our curiosity must have like dissipated probably because we were so tired from you know botanizing just hardcore for days and days and days but if we had you know reached out and felt it you know tasted it smelled it we probably would have had a pretty bad time um so anyways those were a few of the plants that we saw in black water going back all right now we're traveling into alabama so this was Again, we hit that last site in Blackwater in the morning, real quick. And then we traveled up into Alabama. This was a long haul dot day, but it was a fabulous day. So uh, last full day of the trip, we made it to Splinter Hill Bog Preserve. And out here, these are all the flowers of Saracenia leucophila mainly, but a couple other Saracenia pitcher plant species in there. Um, I would say perhaps this was the most dense stand of pitcher plants that we had encountered in the entire trip. Um, this is a 2,000 plus acre preserve, open to the public, which is great for access um, if you wanna go see these guys, um, but actively managed by the Nature Conservancy. This was our first Nature Conservancy property. So interesting to see, there's several different organizations at play with the management and conservation of these species. Um, kind of an overlying theme of our trip here. So the Nature Conservancy, as well as Alabama State Lands Division manage this land. Um, it also goes by the name, the M Ruth McClellan Abronsky Splinter Hill Bog Preserve. Um, that's pertinent as uh, she and her husband, they actually endowed uh, as a conservation endowment uh, as part of this land that they owned an estate adjacent to it. Um, after her passing, they donated that to the preserve and it got even larger, even more habitat was preserved. Um, these these relationships that the Nature Conservancy and other organizations really work together with land over, landowners, neighboring communities. It's important to go back and forth with them, showing them um, the true value of their land and how they can manage that to pass that forward. Um, so not only uh, Ruth McClellan Abronsky, but several other neighboring um, owners have contributed to this conservation endowment in this area. This is known to be home to 12 carnivorous species, so a particularly diverse site. Um, we were able to locate six during our visit here. Um, starting on the bottom, we have you know, our, our carnivorous plants. Um, apologies if we, we keep saying Drosera, I noticed. So we're saying sundews, sundews with the Drosera genus. Um, our beautiful Drosera brevifolia down there, dwarf sundew. Um, moving to the right, we have Saracenia rosea, which there is an example of outside in the bog. Um, all the way over here, again, our white top pitcher plant. And then uh, we'll notice this one in the center, um, his sharp eye. This is actually a naturally occurring hybrid, um, Saracenia micheliana, which is a cross between these two here. So it's more um, prone, lower to the ground, like our roseas are, but it has that wider open hood as well and the coloration of leucophile. So you can see those naturally occurring hybrids um, on the display here. On the top, we got a nice photo of our longleaf pine um, with a nice blazing backdrop of Simplocum, Simplocus, Simplocus tinctoria, which is known as horse sugar. Um, not a very common shrub that we'll see up this way, but going down into this habitat, it almost looked like it was uh, on fire at this point with that orange background. It actually flowers early in the spring and then it'll push out new growth, kind of like our hambonellus, our witch hazels here. Mm -hmm. Um, named horse sugar because uh, grazers really love it. So deer and cattle like those sweet leaves. To the right here, here's a recently burned site. You can see recovering here, the cinnamon ferns emerging out of that burnt soil. Always awesome to see that transition. You know, and so we've been talking about plants, the main focus of this trip. But of course, you know, with me, I want to bring in 
a little bit more. We talked a little bit about the wildlife and the, the insects and the community that we can bring with these plants. Um, these are not all taken at Splinter Hill Preserve, but I thought this was a great um, location to talk about a little bit more. Um, yes, not only are our carnivorous plants consuming insects, but there's a load of pollinators and other insects that are at play in the overall ecology of the system. Um, so everything from our crickets and damselflies up here, we got our wood nymph, this was in the Tupelo Dome, some great orb weavers, nice longhorn beetle on the pitcher plant flower. Here's actually the caterpillar of the Saracenia. He's got a little uh, web covering to make sure nobody can poach him out of there. Um, down, here's the Berthonatory Warbler we've mentioned a couple of times. Um, up here, which I would love to, for you to have a little better look if I can move this. Pause. This is, um, when I heard this bird, I was very, very excited. Um, I wasn't sure if I'd see it on this trip, but it was really, um, this is the Bachman Sparrow, um, also known as a Bog Sparrow. It exists in open, um, open bog environments that do not have that shrub layer, do not have that uh, large tree dominance. Um, it was singing the entire trip. I have a couple audio clips. Uh, I'd be remiss not to mention throughout this entire presentation. Unfortunately, the power, uh, the uh, projector is very quiet, so I wasn't able to totally play those. But if you want to hear this one, I think this should be loud enough. The Bachman Sparrow. So that one right away, uh, you know, perked up my ears. I heard him. He was singing in one of the only longleaf pines in the middle of this bog. Um, it's a territorial male. So he was, you know, really telling everybody that I'm here. They only persist in these um, places that prescribed burns or burns still dominate through because um, they don't really fly around in the landscape. They like to run around through the herbaceous layer. So if it's too thick for them, they're just going to call it quits. Um, and research has shown was the last one. Research has shown that after four years of uh, fire suppression, Bachman sparrows will actually leave the site. So as uh, we keep reintroducing prescribed burns into these areas, you know, Nature Conservancy, Alabama State Lands Division, um, they're not only bringing back this habitat for the, the CPs, our carnivorous plants, but all the wildlife that come along with that. So really a true conservation success story in my mind. One other piece of wildlife here that we were, we were seeing through several different um, mm -hmm. wetlands that we saw. Does anybody know what this is here? Is that a crayfish? Yeah, yeah, that is a crayfish burrow. Oh, well, well, you know, we chose this photo. It's got this nice bog cheeto right next to it. Um, but it, I really want you guys to notice just a, a quick takeaway from this slide. Um, if you see these in any wetland environment, you're in the presence of these crayfish species. There are uh, dozens of different crayfish throughout the Southeast, um, and they're kind of our lesser known ecosystem engineer. So what they do, they'll, uh, they'll burrow down here, they excavate a large amount of chambers. Sometimes, depending on the species, they can go five, 10 feet deep even. Um, and then they kind of pile up all their excess soil up at the top. They can start forming these little chimneys. So you probably notice chimneys before you see the hole itself. Um, really critical to the environment um, to the habitat itself, because these crayfish burrows, they play uh, two great positives to the wildlife around them. It's mm -hmm. overwintering habitat. So for harsh winters, you'll actually find research to some snakes, frogs, salamanders, other insects, all kind of cohabitating in these chambers underneath, um, as well as um, prescribed burns or burns when they go through the environment. These are little hiding holes for other creatures to go down into. So a burn, when it comes through, it's not going to stand on top of the soil for a long time, superheating it. It's just burning off that entire top layer, allowing everybody underneath to be safe. So I hope you hope the crayfish burrows look like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Which brings us to our last site. Um, and this was the one that I was personally the most interested in um, for several reasons. Uh, and Sorry to the people watching the recording. We have been talking to the computer like we're supposed to. So, um, so if you think all the way back to our route map, basically all of our sites were along the coastal plain. And then there was like one way up in Alabama. So this is the one way up in Alabama. Um, quite a different 
situation than we saw at any other site. Um, and also home to the rarest species of Saracenia, Saracenia albinensis, um, which is like extremely endangered. Um, I think in the last 10 years, the, the number of extant populations has gone from like 12 to six or maybe less. Um, so not, not many plants anywhere where it's found and not many populations of this left. And most of the populations that are left are on private property which if you know anything about the legality about protecting plants, if it's on someone's private property, they can do whatever they want to it within their rights. Animals are a little different story. Um, so we were really lucky then for the Alabama Nature Conservancy to give us access to one of the sites that they manage where this species occurs. Um, this is the Roberta Case Pine Hills Preserve, uh, which ABG has worked with this site in the past. Um, there was actually an outplanted population of Saracenia alimensis here that we were unable to locate, uh, but we did find the the primary population that we were going to see. Um, so the, my key takeaways from this site were everything about it was different than what we had seen so far. Basically, everywhere we had been so far was like a flat or flattish wetland bog. Um, this didn't look like a wetland at all because the topography was more like what we would see in the steep head ravines at Terea. It really made us think that we were in the mountains all of a sudden, small mountains, but you know, compared to the, the coastal plain, it was quite dramatic topography. Um, the soil was also quite different um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but we wanted to put our eyes on this habitat because at the time, back in April anyways, most of our mine maxes, Carson's, Saracenia albumensis were not looking so hot and we were, you know, I just been out on a conversation with our colleagues of the North Carolina Botanical Garden who were calling to ask if we could give them some Saracenia alimensis because they had been struggling to cultivate it well in their collections, uh, which made me feel better about what ours looks like at the time. Um, turns out that maybe we were just in a, a lull in the year for that species um, because, you know, all of our collections have really perked up, especially now that we're in like peak Saracenia season, September. Um, but, you know, we wanted to be able to look at the habitat conditions that this species encounters, um, you know, while there are still populations to actually look at, um, which, you know, you never know how much longer that's going to last. Um, and we were hoping that the, the conditions that we were going to see would be able to influence our own cultural practices of this species and maybe help us be better stewards of the next issue. Um, so mainly going to talk about the habitat because that was the primary difference, you know, like it was a wetland, but looking at it, it just looks like any pine woods that you could find around it. Um, so these are actually all longleaf pines, which we were seeing all throughout the coastal plain. So the principal dominant tree component has been maintained up into this habitat, but the topography is so different that they're actually in almost entirely different ecosystems. These are called montane longleaf woodlands we had pretty much been going through coastal longleaf savannas at this point. Um, and it's, it's you know, everything to do with the, the conditions that a carnivorous plant can tolerate is due to its moisture content, basically. And if you know anything about slope, basically, if you have something on like a very steep uh, bed, you're going to have water draining away from it freely. Uh, which seems to be contradictory to the conditions that a carnivorous plant would need. Um, so it was, it was interesting, the, the CPs, they're not in this photo, but they were basically growing like mid-slope. Um, and because Trey was able to interpret all of the, the seepage slopes for us before, we realized that we were just looking at a much different example of the seepage slope. Um, so the, the water was actually confined on this clay layer right here and seeping out uh, where the carnivorous plants occurred, um, but quickly draining away from them instead of sort of being pooled because it was flat, they were quickly draining away from them. Um, and if the soil had been as sandy as we had seen in the other sites, then it were unlikely that the carnivorous plants would be able to persist here. But that was another major difference we noticed. Carson was doing a little soil test. And from what we saw, there was a significantly higher clay content, which is good at holding water in soils than any of the other sites we had seen. So even though it was on this very sharply draining soil, um, the type, like the constitution of the soil allowed it to maintain enough moisture to support 
both Saracenia albumensis as well as the only other CP that we saw besides Drosura brevifolia. Um, but, you know, it's just really interesting to actually be able to see this habitat. It was totally, totally different than any other place that we had been on the trip. And it was nice to sort of end the trip right here, um, especially because we're all stewards of this national collection. This is our rarest species of Saracenia. Uh, so again, not a huge diversity of CPs. We just saw the Saracenia albumensis, which bloomed for us. Like it was like, oh, ABG is going to be here on this day. I'm going to be in full flower. Fun or maybe not so fun fact, Alabama Nature Conservancy burned this site two days later. Um, so no seed recruitment this year, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, spring fires are a part of nature also. It can't all be fall burns. Um, or anyways. Um, so a couple of other plants that we saw that were too pretty not to photograph. And I'll just move this back out of the way. Thanks, Max. Um, the lovely Piedmont azalea that Trey is modeling with in the bottom left, as well as the Viola pedata, um, bird's foot violet, were sort of like indicative that we we're in a really acidic woodland. Um, this is pretty rare in Florida. I think it's probably S1. It might occur just on the coast, like on the state line, but it gets a lot more common further up into the mountains, which we felt like we were in. And of course, the Piedmont azalea is in like every woodland, every acidic woodland throughout the Piedmont in Georgia. Um, but it was also nice to see the blackjack oak, Quercus marylandica. That was just a, an indicator that we we're in yet another fire dominated ecosystem. Um, so, yeah. And I think Max has some nice takeaways for us, or would we all like to? Okay. So, does any, anyone have any questions? Okay, uh, we have a question slide. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk about it. Start thinking about them. Now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Just to, to wrap everything up, uh, we learned a ton on the trip about carnivorous plants and we're hoping to be able to use some of this information to inform our practices. The Albumensis site was definitely the most interesting and um, maybe the biggest takeaway just because of the difference in the habitats, but we had a lot of other key takeaways. Um, one of them is that the slight changes in elevation drastically affect the composition of the species in the wetlands. And that the carnivorous plants, unfortunately, um, are under a lot of threats from human disturbances, like the fire suppression, invasive species, plant poachers, um, and then land development. Right. Um, and yeah. then, like, so like, oh, sorry, okay. I was just gonna say, like Trey was saying, you know, he grew up there and none of the rest of us who grow carnivorous plants, the national accredited collection of Saracenias rather, um, had ever seen these plants in the wild being able to actually go down and, you know, like be amongst them in their home uh, gave us all like a context that we were lacking. Yeah. Um, which is context is king. Context is everything. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it brings it all together. It helps you understand why you're, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? Right. Uh, they're not just, they don't exist in isolation. They don't exist a, only in plastic containers in a greenhouse. A, you know, right. a bit of tissue in a, in a, in a tube somewhere. Uh, you have to understand how these systems or how these uh, species interact with their environments and within the landscape. It's it's um, sort of a big picture situation, which is what ecology is really all about. Mm -hmm. It's all about the big picture. And sure. being able to um, share this with you guys to come back and do things like lunch and learns um, is really important. And also uh, working with volunteers and visitors that come by but like being able to go on trips like this give us um, sort of this full story connection to our plants that we can use to inspire other people about native plants. Um, being that we're here with the, the large conservation display garden that we have outside with the bog at the centerpiece of that, um, definitely if you know there are some questions uh, that or want to see some of these species out there, I'd love to show those to you, you know, uh, be a little bit more specific with them. Um, but being able to visit all these sites, these different habitats, see the whole ecosystem at play, I feel like um, coming back now to the bog and getting to see this whole season cycle of the plants, 
um, every visitor that comes through, you know, it's cool. They, the children, especially you hear carnivorous plants, you know, they're eating things. Ooh, wow. Awesome. Gross. Um, but on top of all that, you know, there, there are so many other plants planted among them, creating this awesome display bed, um, which this really gives me an opportunity to share a little bit more, a little bit extra with any visitor that comes by. Okay. Now. <laughs> yeah, we did hear it. Yes, a lot. Uh, <laughs> George, George, George. Okay. Yeah, George. Okay. All right. So, on the trip. Now, I want to put both the hot takes. You guys learn the thought of things for influence growing here at Seafood, like Alamensis. What's the takeaway? Do you guys like you got some ideas on what you're going to switch out on doing praise and keep on? Yeah, right. So, um, that's a great question. And while it was a bit, at least for like, we did this trip sort of at the end where you want to end of the season where you want to like start messing with the actively growing carnivorous plants. Um, so we didn't like immediately come home and repot all of our alabamensis and like, you know, a clay sandy mixture. Um, are we thinking about that for next season? Totally. Um, I'm several of us in the conservation research department are doing this like big trial with a bunch of different species of Saracenias growing them from seeds and a bunch of different conditions. And I think that, you know, seeing the, these plants in their, in their habitat is really going to influence, you know, the mixes we use or, you know, the seasonality of the different chores that we're doing with the maintenance of these plants. Um, I definitely think a, a drainier mix for albumensis and probably, you know, not letting them sit in water like all the time just most of the time um, it's something I'm thinking about. Um, but another thing that that species in particular suffers from, I think, is because there's so few plants, so few populations, um, probably, you know, any plants that are collected out of the wild these days are already pretty inbred um, just because there's only so many individuals and you can be the greatest horticulturist in the world. And if you have a plant that's related to itself like 17,000 different ways, you know, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. Um, so, but we're just trying our best. Does that answer your question, George? Yeah, and good. the question was, um, what takeaways about horticultural practices are we bringing back specifically from the trip? One other thing I'd like to mention. So with uh, the processes out in play of the display blog, um, it's a man-made blog. So when, you know, they're talking about the different layers, we have a, a plastic liner layer, which is that impermeable layer. Um, on top of that, yes. bed is sand, and then our CP mix, which is our, our peat and sand mix. Um, this kind of put it, again, further into perspective of why, you know, there is such a large renovation process in the, win in the winter when we take out a third of the bog, and clean off plants, respace, resoil. Um, understanding this ecosystem practice at play. We can't burn the bog out there. So we have to find, you know, creative ways to maintain that, remove biomass, but also replenish the, the soil. Um, so really, uh, you know, nail it down. Okay, these are the roles that these maintenance tasks play. Um, I think that's important to consider with any bed that you're looking at, um, native or otherwise plants. Uh, the other thing, I, it started kind of visualizing uh, the different sections of the bog or different Saracenia species. And the Saracenia albumensis are at the bottom end of the slope, kind of where it starts pulling the water out quicker than up on top where it's kind of flat. So I believe, you know, uh, with uh, the creation of the bog and the expertise and the, the people before me taking in these ecosystem approaches um, understood, hey, this is the best place for the albumensis. It isn't just because we hit the other species than this. It was well thought out on that whole bed. Shani, you had a question? It was really similar. Thank you, Bob, George. Um, <laughs> but more so regarding the floating bogs. Um, that's really drastic and different what we do here. Um, are there any hopes of something similar being put in place or mimic here at any point in time with something of that nature? You know, I've, I've brought this up to Mary Pat several times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she just she just doesn't think that it's like financially tenable to install a spring fed river in the garden. In the town. <laughs> That's it would be really cool to be able to do that. But I'm not even really, you know, that 
floating or those floating bogs there there are dozens of them along live oak creek and on uh boiling creek i suppose they probably take decades to uh you know come about and and what i don't know that anybody's ever like done a, a dug through the middle of it to find out what the actual composition is that was my follow-up to you uh, the investigation sports it would be an interesting about. thing to look into i don't know how you would be able to recreate a situation like that unless you just did the floating yeah. Yeah. Well, you know like back in the day yes it's really nice that those in, yeah. that those environments have, have uh, remained as intact as they have at eglin air force base because they're i've taught ecosystem identification courses on that air force base a number of times and you could hear the bombing going on in the distance and you can even feel the concussions that's one of the soundscapes that we couldn't play yeah before. unfortunately yeah. and they also tested agent orange in, in uh, the area around boiler creek during or before the uh, vietnam war which is a defoliant mm -hmm. and so you can see the remnants of a forest along the edge of boiler creek in places these dead trunks there with the much younger and stunted trees growing beneath them so it's uh it's just a miracle that that so much of that uh, place has uh, survived in, intact, not just the early uh, extractive uses of, of, of the forest by settlers and and so forth, but the uh, depredations of the United States military on top of that. It was once a national forest that was taken by the DOD during the uh, Cold War. Sorry. Sorry, I just had, so your guys' questions are so germane, and I would think that what um, these guys will take away with them is, yeah, not all Terracinians get the same horticultural treatment, right? And so some of, when we have the bog beds flooded and some of them need to be differently flooded and longer flooded you know, than others, it sort of speaks to, no, we don't have spring fed creeks that can offer that habitat, but we can keep them watered and inundated well, some of the other ones, you know, just adding a little bit of finesse to how we manage our collections, our conservation collections, which are really safeguarding collections. They're not display collections. They're being managed literally in the case of the Alabamensis. A lot of, some of those sites have been extirpated. They have, we got, we got whatever's up there. Um, we have put in a couple different times for funding requests to look at the genetics of um, <clears throat> some of the different, um, just shot out of my head, but it includes the Thericinia albamensis that are the family to find out, you know, how genetic are they need? Are they diverse? Um, in nature, they didn't occur widely across, or at least not that we've been able to capture um, across um, that area in Alabama. <clears throat> um, but I guess just to speak to your question, that some of the vertical practices that we're already doing address some of those questions of having. Um, you know, the, the extreme water all the way up to the much drier um, habitats. Having which said, y'all are amazing. Go create some ponds, you know, maybe down in the <laughs> right. Right. Let us do it. We are. Right. It's hot. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, the true value in the display garden gives, you know, visitors that entry. Oh, that's what all these plants are. And yes, they do exist in the wild. And there are still places where you can, you know, respectfully go and see them. Um, and they're, so, in the, you know, they're local, relatively speaking. Yeah, like you can drive did through. something that we're working with, um, upper level management, is in the hallway where we've got, you know, right now we've got insects that are down through their legs that Cammy Adams, one of our, our field techs, um, have taken. Those little indentations as you walk down the hallway originally were intended to have like cameras or uh, like um, TV monitors. And so it's not impossible that in the fullness of time, there might not be the there might be the opportunity to really display some some of what we see when we're out doing our conservation work, which you know, we also you can't see it otherwise. Um, but also to display um, that natural it's a great opportunity to display. Okay. <laughs> um, so you've got those little mini areas you put in the cascade yes right maybe if you could figure out the the way to replicate the hydrology and everything put it at the bottom of the cascade and up on that's Ooh. definitely an idea I, uh, so amy she's referring to the bog pockets we have uh traveling down the cascade so those are reinstalled this year and they, they've done fairly well 
um, throughout the season. I think that's definitely an area where there, I'm there not could sure. be some. Got a lot to do with the water flow. Yeah, so, that's some flow. So, if you could figure out the 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 right equation there, I think that could definitely be replicated. Also, I want to ask. Yes. Uh, did you see any gopher tortoise or? I didn't uh, see any gophers, but we did see. We saw. Uh, Right. Well, there were a lot of uh, Chuckles widows. Not we did get some, uh, some uh, we had Chuckles widows like roosting in the trees overhead at one of our campsites in the Apachical National Forest. And they didn't shut up until <laughs> dawn. Like they started when the sun went down and they didn't stop. It was a full moon that night. And uh, they just, yeah, they, they serenaded us. Mm -hmm. Well, and Peaceful. you guys spend a lot of time in, in the pines, you know, in the lonely. Yeah, we didn't uh, see any gophers, but no, but did see a skunk. Yeah, we yeah. didn't hear and see those. Yeah. Yeah. First time I've ever seen a skunk down there, actually. I've been living in that area yeah, my entire cool. life. Right. I've never seen a skunk. You all saw that on the way back to Tumultra. Yeah. Well, that was a, that's a whole crazy story, really. Uh, uh, this one was, I believe it was a striped skunk. Was it a skunk or skunk aid? It was a skunk. Okay. <laughs> All right. It was much too small. Sorry, any any other questions? Yes. Yeah. yeah um, I noticed a picture about um, a loss of his pollinating one. Correct me if I'm wrong. But in general, did you notice any particular pollinators going about the bogs, kind of being more specific to certain species or certain plants? Mm, I'd say at that time, uh, skipper butterflies, the smaller butterflies, are fairly prevalent. Um, those along with a lot of beetles. There was, those that, there was one photo of the longhorn beetle, that but they were really cool. attracted to those. So, um, which we do witness a lot out in the bog throughout the season as well. So, less carpenter bees. I'll say that we have more carpenter bees here, but that's yeah, true. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. See you guys. Bye guys. Bye John. Oh, Jeff, is he going to say something? No, no, he's not. Oh, say something, Jeff. It was fantastic, man. I loved it. I loved it. What a trip. Jeff said. What a trip. Nice. Thanks, and Carson Jeff. did a great job talking about Deer Lake. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. See you guys. Thanks, Jeff. See ya. Back to work.